Hi. Welcome, everyone, to tonight's convening of a roundtable around the Chicago Architecture Biennial Make New History. Um, we've invited Mark Lee and Sharon Johnston, this year's curators of the show, um, with an assistant curator, Sarah Hearn, and UCLA's exhibitors in order to discuss um, their work and the theme of the biennial. So uh, in the catalog, um, Sarah Herta discusses that one of the major objectives of the biennial is to convene a discussion around the work. So while we're not in Chicago to see it firsthand, we have a number of participants who can bring their work to us through a series of short presentations, um, beginning with the curator's statements. Um, we'll then move to a collection of people, some of which share the same room. So we'll have Mark, Sharon, and Sarah present the curatorial introduction, followed by Andrew Kovacs, Jimenez Lai, and Aaron Besler who were in the room titled Horizontal City. We'll have uh, Sylvia Laven and Aaron Besler discuss their project Supermodels with Thomas Kelly. And uh, we'll have Juan A. X, uh, discuss their, in their project for the Vertical City um, with his firm Productura. And then finally, we'll have a discussion amongst the participants with um, moderated by Michael Osmond. So please help me in welcoming Mark Lee, Sharon Johnson, and Sarah Hearn. Uh, sure, yeah. Are we going to be part of this discussion too afterwards? Or? Oh, okay, good, yeah. We were wondering, no, we're yeah. Out of here. yeah. So uh, we, we have limited time, so we thought we can just be more uh, factual. We, just, we thought we can just uh, present the context of the biennial so that it sets the, the physical context, sets the stage for the, the, the work of the participants, and then we can talk more about the intentions behind the biennial, the curatorial intention during the uh, roundtable discussion. So the title of the biennial is Make New History. It runs from September 16th until the first week of January. The inspiration of the title is it's basically the title was stolen from a, a, a Ed Ruscha artist book that was done um, 10 years ago. Uh, when we uh, sent out the prompt to the participants, we anticipated four general categories. One is building histories, how architects are looking back into buildings. Um, we look at image histories, histories of representation, material histories, the, the flow of materials and its histories, and, as well as civic histories, dealing with an, an urban scale that's larger than architecture. The, 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 um, the mothership of the uh, biennial happens at the Chicago Cultural Center. It was the former Chicago Public Library built in the end of the 19th century by uh, Shepley Rutten Coolidge from H.H. Uh, Richardson's office, who also did the um, uh, Art Institute. Uh, it was a, a public space, a great reading rooms, Beaux-Arts building, not a great uh, conduit for exhibitions in, in our view. So uh, as architects, um, we were thinking very architecturally about how to curate the show. So we wanted to uh, walk through certain rooms and how we think about these rooms. Um, there are two large rooms that were the former reading rooms where we had a, where we thought of a specific curated project and we invited participants to be in. The first is the Vertical City in the Yates Hall, which was the former reading room of the library. And uh, we decided to um, use the Chicago Tribune uh, competition of 1922 as the program when we invited uh, 20, uh, sorry, 15 architects to each do a new interpretation of the uh, Chicago Tribune Tower. Um, we also reconstructed two towers. Uh, one is the one by Lowe's on the left, and the other is the unsubmitted um, uh, scheme by Ludwig Hilbersheimer, who later became the uh, planner of Chicago. In our view, uh, the, perhaps the two uh, opposite ends of the spectrum of all the, all the schemes that were submitted in 1922, the year that also Mies did, some, did the uh, glass skyscraper. So uh, it's, it's a one-to-one -one scale uh, hypostyle hall uh, arranged in a, in a checkerboard manner, um, but also a scale model of these towers, They're about 15 feet um, about 15, 16 feet tall. 
So you see an array of, uh, of, of towers from the lows in the front of, 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 of this image. Uh, Moss uh, with the glass block uh, skyscraper to the right. Uh, Studio Barazzi Vega to the left. Um, right, they're also sandwiched by two installations, one of uh, the Chicago-based artist Inigo Magliano Ovalle with the beehives, and on the opposite end, Charles Waltheim, who's going to lecture here this quarter, um, with the uh, Harvard Urbanized in Innovations Group, uh, designed a series of towers that are in the north side of the room. Uh, Francis Carre, you'll see a bit of Ron Boney's project later. Um, uh, Eric Lapierre did a, did, a, did a column Tatiana Bilbao in the center, and uh, Anton Garcia Brill to the right. Series Architects did a, a version of a, a pagoda, an abstracted version of a pagoda, and they interpreted it as a series of living platforms that are stacked on top of one another. And then to the right of Siri, the red tower is by Chris Gantenbein, who basically did an objet trouvé. They want to out-trump a, a, a low store column by recreating one-to-one -one scale, uh, a parking garage that was built in Sao Paulo in 1964. Um, there's a second large room that's right beneath the Eighth Hall, um, the Grand Army Rotunda, where we invited 24 architects to each select an image of an interior that is important for them or for their work, and we asked them to reinterpret that interior through their own language. Um, the, the arrangements of these interior rooms are based on the first uh, master plan of Mies van der Rohe's uh, IIT campus. So for us, I think the Chicago Tribune Tower and the IIT campus, I think, represents two uh, paradigms of Chicago architecture in the histories of Chicago architecture, one vertical, one horizontal. Um, installation of all the, um, the interior rooms. Um, see um, Bureau Spectacular in the foreground, uh, Schaub Hyman right behind it where they interpreted um, Yves Laurent's uh, apartment after he died in three different stages. Uh, welcome projects, did an um, interpretation of Corbusier's best degree um, a roof garden. Um, a mile from Barcelona, we're looking at the interiors and the, the, the uh, furniture objects as a way to constitute space together with this uh, Duchampian door. Uh, Urban Lab. Um, uh, took an image by Super Studio. They're interested in this infinite extension uh, in contrast to the establishment of a, a, a very delimited de de space in, in, the, uh, in the mountain that the Super Studio grafted on. Or the same thing with Kurma Co. We're looking at the Amer American bar of, of, of Out of Flow, something that is very uh, close and intimate and, and at the same time ex expansive uh, above the clear story. Well, Sultan von Moos. Um, interpreted or basically replicated Otto van Eyck's uh, pavilion, the sculpture of the pavilion. For them, it's the, uh, a, a building that's situ it's situated on the threshold between interior and exterior, and then uh, uh, utilize a series of found objects to, to be in place of all the modern sculpture that was in the original pavilion. And, and right next to that room, in the larger, underneath the larger glass rotunda, was a, a scale model of Sana's uh, project for the expansion of the uh, IIT master plan towards the lake. So building on some of the sort of most significant great halls in the cultural center is Exhibition Hall, which is anchored by two sort of large-scale, full-scale replicas. This is um, Sylvia and Aaron and Thomas's project that she'll talk about, Supermodels. And it was paired with um, this pavilion by Bauku and Stefano Graziani, um, the sort of replica of um, Giotto's Padua pavilion, a sort of reinterpretation of that, the meeting of um, Enrico Fermi and the Queen of Sheba, the impossible meeting. And I think this room uh, then also brings together other projects that, for example, uh, Veronica Kellendorfer looking at Mises National Gallery in a state of sort of deconstruction and reconstruction as it's to be renovated. And then um, this is an interior and initial study from Baku. And then next to Baku is Dogma's The Room of One's Own that looks at the kind of singular room, the most private room, as a sort of foundation of an, of an idea about identity and a connection to a larger urban um, collective. So these are details of these pretty incredible drawings that they produced. Then on the second floor, on the Chicago galleries, which are sort of the great rooms, also more traditional galleries in the building, um, we re-envisioned these as sort of salon-type hangs. So in this room, this is a, a, the collaborative work of um, 
Parisa Sinjin and Thomas Dumond, and also includes a series of photographs of Helene Benet of Caruso's work. So I think the role of uh, artists and architects working together in different ways is also a sub-theme of the biennial that Farah's gonna talk a little bit more about. Uh, and the second room in this suite of galleries is um, you're looking at Bach Gordon, Ricardo Bach Gordon from Portugal, um, using a collection of, of, of hand sketches, and then in the foreground, uh, the work of Studio Mumbai, working with traditional modes of creating these bamboo, these very delicate bamboo um, funerary and other memorial type structures um, as architecture. This is uh, a work by Made In. This is a collaboration between their studio and um, they're students at the ETH, so I think the role of um, kind of collaboration between students and practitioners was also um, part of the larger, some of the larger collaborative models. Um, Peza van Orlikhausen looking um, at serial structures, kind of creating their own history through this sort of intense, um, extreme serialization. Um, and then, of course, um, uh, Stanley Tigerman and, and Margaret McCurry were an important sort of founding um, people and their archive was, was um, seminal to the biennial and this is some early paintings of Stanley's work. And then on the ground floor, uh, we tried to re-envision these rooms as what we call labyrinths, so creating kind of room and room structures that would allow, uh, bring work together in a way that we thought would be more meaningful and create more kind of distinguished galleries on that ground floor. So in each one of those small rooms were sort of generally media-based projects. This is a collaboration between um, Jürgen Meyer Ha and Philip Ushbrun called Cosmic Latte. Um, I won't go into the details of that, but another pavilion was the work of uh, Work AC, who were looking at a kind of important historic villa in Beirut through analysis, photography, and other kind of film media. And then looking also, I think the project, as Mark mentioned, moves between you know looking at kind of details of buildings to more civic scale. So this is a sort of re-look at the contemporary Paris through the Houseman plan that was collab a collaboration with a number of architects and engineers. Um, and also material was a key part of um, a number of the work in the biennial. So this is Piovani Fabi looking at Franco Albini's Milan Metro and kind of reimagining those materials with those traditional fabricators producing new kinds of furniture elements that borrow the materials, colors, and techniques of fabrication from those historic sites. And then Point Supreme, these kind of fantastic reimaginings of material boards. So these are the way in which they collect kind of lost, forgotten, or displaced materials and, and repurpose them in a series of, of homes in Greece. And then uh, Archie Union, looking at traditional um, materials and assembly techniques in China, crossing that with contemporary modes of um, computer-aided uh, production and assembly. And then finally, um, looking this notion of the archive and the, the way in which we communicate ideas as architects was um, centered around a room produced by Mullet Geyser, uh, based out of Houston, it's called Rooms for Books. So, there were four rooms. This is the archive of Stanley and Margaret's uh, works that were just donated to the Graham, and then there was a room for making and discussion. The Graham had their bookstore, and then there's a library of all the participants' work. Okay, um, so alongside the, um, the, the sort of salon typologies uh, and the labyrinth, uh, we also had some commissions that were, um, let's say, site-specific to the building. Um, so, for instance, we, we would sort of approach one, an architect like Anya Jaworska um, and offer her the space of the, the lobby um, on Randolph Street. Um, and in this case, she kind of reinterprets um, an existing office desk, information desk, um, into some sort of um, play of arches and columns. Um, Frida Escobedo um, was given the lobby space um, of the Randolph Square side of the building. Uh, and she had this sort of singular gesture, which was a uh, modulated... Um, you know, surface for inhabitation, which during the opening was completely flat, but over the course of the um, biennial has kind of opened up into more of a forum with seat, tiered seating. Um, so these are sort of site specific responses to a building that already has a clear kind of inhabitation. So this space is very, sorry, this space is very used in Chicago. There's students that study there and now, you know, some of the furniture in the building has migrated onto this surface, so it's, it's becoming quite active and used. Um, Likewise, we had these interstitial spaces on the landings where you have um, a firm 
like Monadnock, who are playing on a, a kind of a quip um, by Burnham, make no uh, little plans. Uh, and they were sort of looking at the idea of sky uh, signage uh, and turning that into a, a sort of synthetic skyscraper, a skyscape on the, uh, on the landing there. Um, Deville de Vink had a sort of capsule um, exhibition of some of their ongoing work around um, producing ornaments as decoration. So they were sort of bringing together um, several of their um, examinations that they've done in other site-specific places, and they've just moved them and kind of collected them together um, on one of the landings as well. Um, and the Empire, Ludovico Centis's um, Chicago Pile is a one-to-one -one model um, of the Chicago Pile by Italian physicist Enrico Fermi. Uh, so this is part of his ongoing research around the sort of um, the architectural history of America, uh, the sort of history of American nuclear architecture. Uh, so he's kind of uses a sort of a view from the top, but in a way it's a sort of one to one of this kind of very rationalised cube form of the Chicago pile. Um, German uh, fashion designers, artists, um, Bless had uh, been given the lounge on the fourth floor um, outside of the exhibition hall. Uh, and they were working with Artec, with the Kiki furniture, um, which is designed by Ilmari Tapiavari and produced in, 19, in the 1960s. It's sort of a classic piece. And they worked with Artec in order to kind of um, adapt these uh, and customize them. And then they dressed them and kind of um, absorbed them in um, you know, synthetic um, marble that they had um, sourced from the building. There are also these legacy projects that uh, are left over from the 2015 biennial. Um, which Sarah Herder and Joseph Grimer directed. So you had Italia Bauwell's um, Piranesi Circus, which is in the courtyard in the centre of the building and is extremely popular still, um, with everyone passing through asking what it is. Um, and we decided to invite um, Anna Holtrip in order to kind of engage with this um, existing uh, kind of the ladders and the, the sort of play of um, Bauwell's project. Um, it got stuck in customs. Uh, which is kind of, uh, I think, an sort of interesting story for the opening, but we'll be launching um, this in November, I think, around some programming about November 15th to 17th. Um, so that would be worth going to see. Um, and then we had um, Bob Somol, who uh, was kind of involved in the catalogue as well, but he had this project where we were asking the participants to send us three reference images, um, and then he kind of uh, organised them in a certain way and kind of... Uh, he called it the graphic equaliser, and he was looking for certain characteristics around uh, what their proclivities were, what, what uh, their interests were with the precedents. And you can see it's kind of a, you know, a system where he could imagine that you could um, mix up your own uh, new piece of architecture out of the, the sort of um, interests of the participants. Um, likewise, I think the building, so it's an um, 1890s building, but then there was a renovation in the 1970s before it became, when it shifted from the public library into the cultural centre. Um, and what that renovation in the 1970s did was leave a whole bunch of kind of strange interstitial spaces with kind of quite banal um, uh, institutional finishes. And in a way, that's where some of our other uh, legacy projects are. Like this was from the 2015 biennial, again, Soil um, did these kind of um, webbed steel uh, structures, or not structures, kind of um, arcades. And so this is sort of what we were, again, um, building on, upon by giving um, other architects arcades to work on. So you had Paul and Paul from Chicago um, who uh, had taken this sort of institutional glazed brick and set up an enfilade so that they produced this whole series of viewing spaces down that um, rather kind of awkward space that becomes a little bit um, more interesting in order to kind of view other shows, other works. Um, and then we had a gen agenda um, who were working with one of the top level um, uh, interstitial spaces and they were uh, they had worked with a photographer, um, Camelia Ekivari, um, who has these sort of photographs of, let's say, mesian surfaces and also these kind of moss and lichen finishes that he turns into these velvet curtains and they lined the space with that and then the curtains also became these niches where um, Agenda would show um, pho photographs of their own work um, mixed in with other works of vernacular architecture from Colombia where they're based. Um, and then we had the crossover space, which was sort of found um, in the 2015 um, biennial and kind of um, casually called her to hall because she found it and it became a sort of space that has been used, which has this really excellent view all the way up the stairwell on the Randolph side. And that's where Andy Zago um, had his uh, installation, which is a half scale um, facade of the um, Detroit Museum of Contemporary Art that he was kind of uh, testing out at a sort of slightly larger scale with sort of the play of color and figuration. And Pascal Flammer uh, made this kind of stacked 
uh, fiberglass tower as well. It sort of looks like it's escaped from the Yates Hall. Um, and then Go Hasegawa was working um, with scrims and light in order to kind of um, show his, illuminate his, um, his own drawings that are um, etched on gold leaf. Um, and then, you know, um, Keith Cromwitty, who had sort of taken a, um, a, 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 sorry, a historical wallpaper from the Museum of, um, from the Met, which had been replicated in the 1970s, the Monuments of Paris. Um, and he kind of then combined that with some of his ongoing work with Freedom Land, where he's looking at kind of um, sort of stitching his own um, satir satirical take on like with mansions um, into historical scenes. Um, we also had a um, Jesus Vassilo who curated a lot of the art, um, the photography in the exhibition. His show was called A Love of the World. Um, this was the main kind of access on Michigan um, Avenue where he sort of had his text and everything. His show was about um, looking at contemporary photographers who were photographing the built environment um, and, and looking at, I guess, um, the way the, um, the, the term, the built environment, is kind of also constructed through certain ideas about photography. Um, this is, I probably could just sort of scroll through these since we're a bit late for time. But these are some of the photographers who were featured in this show and some of them were site specific, like Marion Mueller, who was up in Gar Hall. Um, they were kind of distributed through, through the building. Um, James Welling as well. We um, actually had James Welling in the water tower with Jared and Kelly um, who had some videos, but we also had his photographs scaled up to become a sort of frieze um, on the building there. So it's sort of at the scale of the billboard. In the um, and then alongside the curatorial, there was also a catalog um, that was sort of happening somewhat before the show actually opened in order to get it out in time. And so that has things like conversation um, with Mark and Sharon and Sarah Herder from last year talking about the legacy and the, the contemporary biennial. Um, it also has essays and participant um, kind of statements and a lot of photography. And it's published by Lars Mueller and designed by Zach Design. Zach Group. The biennial's on view until November 7th, if you have any kind of um, Thanks, Heather, for um, inviting me to do this. Thank you. Um, Mark, Sharon, and um, Sarah for curating the biennial. <laughs> um, so uh, I was asked to only talk for five minutes, so let me just set my timer to make sure um, I don't go over. So this presentation is called Five Minutes on Proposal for Collective Living Two or homage to Sir John Stone. Um, this is basically what we did. Um, as Mark mentioned, we, we, we were asked um, to start with an image. Um, this is what we started with. It's the section of um, Sir John Stone's home in England, who was an architect and collector. Um, we sort of wanted to eliminate everything in Stone's collection and provide a new updated collection. Maybe almost another way to think of it would be um, everything Sir John Soane could have collected if he lived forever. Um, and so our ambition was really to kind of make the existing section of the Soane house and basically refill the, the collection. Um, the problem was when we had to sort of put it on the plinth, uh, in option number one, uh, the scale that we were comfortable in making the model was too large for the plinth. Uh, we proposed to proportionately scale up the plinth to fit the model, um, but then we would have this sort of extra space that we didn't like. And then we even suggested to scale down the plinth. Nobody told us that the plinth was uh, the master plan of uh, IIT um, un until we arrived. So I guess that's an instance of making new history where Mies is somehow uh, regulating uh, Sir John Stone. Um, but so then we said, okay, well, what if we do this? We sort of eliminate all the walls um, in the Stone house and kind of make a reinterpretation of the collection um, as the model. And they said kind of, okay, but how are you going to do it? And I said, well, we're going to freestyle it. And they said, what does that mean? And I said, like in sports, you know, featuring relatively unfree, unrestricted movement or int or intended to demonstrate inv individual special skills or style. And they said, what? And I said, like free jazz. You know, where musicians attempted to alter, extend, or break down jazz convention often by discarding fixed chord changes or tempos. 
And I said, you know, with an emphasis on collective improvisation. Uh, and they said, so what? And I said, um, it'll look something like this, or like this, or like this, and we'll try to fill the volume of the plinth um, as much as we can. And then they said, okay. Um, and then we got to work. Um, it was me, Summer Lou, and Aaron Wright, a sort of e eclectic bunch, uh, right here sort of looking for materials um, to assemble. So this is at the uh, thrift store. Uh, we also visited the 99 cent store to collect materials, the street market, um, and the paper store. Uh, we found out that Thomas Demand actually buys his paper from this store, um, but we weren't buying the paper that he buys, but rather the scraps. Since the, <laughs> since the gentleman at this store sells scraps for five cents, 10 cents, and 25 cents. So it was very sort of economical considering the amazing budget we were given. Um, so this is kind of what the scene in the office uh, sort of looks like of us kind of piecing these things, piecing these various um, objects together. Uh, we became very good at uh, patching cupcakes, um, but also kind of cleaning this uh, chest of dressers and eventually sanding it. And you might say, well, how can a chest of dressers be architecture? Um, this book, thankfully, was floating around the studio. That's a picture of uh, Saul Steinberg. Um, and he, at one point, actually showed <laughs> Um, that or imagine the chest of dressers as a building, and we later found out that in North Carolina, um, a, tress, a chest of dressers um, exists as a building. Um, and, then, and then there were sort of moments of um, incredible human uh, creativity. For example, when we discovered uh, this cap, um, and we realized we could cut it into very small slices and use it for parts of the model, or to say, fill this hole in a piece that would eventually uh, become this little planter. Um, so at some point, the model uh, looked like this, and we knew that we had a very long way to go. Um, but here are some early shots of the model uh, in progress. So kind of even pieces that are very, very deep in the model uh, that you end up not seeing are still uh, just as detailed as the pieces that you do see. Um, and so part of this also, we started to document all the materials that we're, we were using. So here, a kind of inventory of all the various uh, paper types, um, various pieces of uh, facades from uh, train models. And then at some point, we had the really brilliant idea to dump all the rubble from the construction of this model onto a book scanner uh, and produce sort of images uh, like this. Uh, but we also, uh, as part of this documented the, say, dust of, uh, that was produced from the model. Um, so here is finally uh, the model. Um, so if in Sohn's home, uh, you, a collection is maybe meant to be viewed in our reinterpretation, um, a collection is maybe meant to be occupied. Um, if Sohn's home really kind of plays up the interior, maybe by kind of eliminating the walls we propose that a collection could reimagine interior as um, sort of forming kind of exterior environments. Um, and if Sohn's home, or if, if Sohn's home is a home for say one, maybe by kind of our reinterpretation is to imagine it not as a home for one, but maybe a kind of home for a sort of collective, so a kind of um, larger kind of agglomeration of, of stuff. Um, so that's my time. Uh, that's the last image. Thanks. That we, this is the image we chose. Um, was the interior of Adolf Loos's Mueller house, realized in Prague in 1930. There are two primary reasons we chose this image, uh, voyeurism being one, and the principle of cladding being the other. Just to provide a little context, we were in the horizontal city room, Andrew's back there, Aaron's here, and we're here in the foreground. The title of our project is Another Run Plan. We took this opportunity to consider the status of architecture as a machine for voyeurism. We wanted to find a way to further uh, elaborate upon our reading of Beatrice Colomina's reading of Lose's work and spend time to further this uh, diagram. Um, to say that an architecture to say that an architecture could be a machine for voyeurism is also to say that there is a spectator-spectacle relationship between multiple players inside this continuous interior. 
if we consider architecture as a stage that builds characters, there are players that play their parts, and there will be viewers who become the audience. Upon further reading of the Moller House, uh, we, began to, we began to see a clear division between two parts of the same house, one side of the house that views, the other that performs. Um, the great hall, or something like a living room, looks back at the other four programs, a kitchen or a servant, uh, an entry, entryway corridor or a stranger, the children's room, uh, where the children are, and uh, the ladies' boudoir, uh, where, I guess, where the ladies used to sit. This is a story about the construction of power within architecture. The voyeur is not just an audience member, but a person who's in control of the other four characters. Uh, this is a house uh, where, when, I guess in 2013, I wrote a story titled Sociopaths. It is a short graphic novel about a murder case uh, with three witnesses, one, uh, all of them suspects. The wife in this murder mystery tells a story about jealousy, lust, and revenge. She describes a silent dinner party and attempted, an attempt at love affair, uh, and the act of spying, and a physical altercation between the two men. In this story, she takes a bust, sculpted, sculpted in the likeness of the eventual murder, murder victim, and drops it on the head of the victim uh, from the mezzanine. As he, as, as, she, as, he, as he nears the final seconds of his life, his gaze haunted her, uh, she could not tell whether his final glance uh, was at her or at himself. Because we also saw the flip side of voyeurism being narcissism. In our model, we installed a one-way uh, one mirror, where four, four one-way mirrors uh, for the four characters who are being watched uh, from the living room. We installed buttons uh, on either ends of the podium of the, where the model sits on. From the living room side, the act of turning on or off the, the internal lighting system meant whether or not the four, uh, uh, four portals can be revealed. However, the buttons on the other side uh, of the servant, the stranger, the children, and the ladies do not work. We created this built-in false hope uh, that any self-help is meaningful at all. The principle of cladding is the second reason we chose the Moeller House. Oh, that was meant to be the false hope. Uh, the principle of cladding is this, the second reason we chose the Moeller House as our test subject. The principle of cladding, of cladding is an essay written by Loos in 1898. Uh, in it, Loos talks about the status of uh, a livable material. The carpet or an animal hide uh, is a livable, livable material. Loos argued that the act of covering oneself with animal hide was the first architectural detail of cladding. This idea is something that I worked on in 2011 when I wrote the story, Primitives. Um, through the story, I was able to work through ideas about skinning, quilting, uh, cladding, all acts about the covering of oneself in animal hide. The reduction of detail meant uh, the, make, the making of a mystery. The absence of the human face meant a self un unable to convey one's exact, th exact thinking, relying only on abstract body language to communicate. It was around this time I used the story to consider the uh, possibility that architecture can be characters. Uh, the White Elephant Project was such a case. We went on to, so far as uh, using ca actual real cowhide on the inside of the White Elephant Project uh, so that we can create an object that is hard on the outside, soft on the inside. Uh, it coincided with many important conversations at the time that I believe are still ongoing, including Jason Payne's Raspberry Field Project where he ingeniously used properties of everyday architectural material to give the building a nice haircut. Uh, if not for the fact that uh, we are able to uh, wink or nod at the Lina Lowe's bedroom. Sorry. Uh, or the fact that um, the, the Moeller House is growing its own five o'clock shadow anyway. Um, we cladded this furry beast with a livable material. Uh, in the making of this abominable snow creature, we even gave it other qualities that would enhance its readability as a character. For, insta for instance, for every viewport, uh, uh, for internal purposes, we referred this as orifices. Uh, we uh, casted lips for all of the orifices. I uh, want to thank Aaron Day for helping us uh, through this process. We went, through, uh, we went through a medical supply store to find a rubber that most resembled human flesh. 
uh, most supple, touchable, uh, huggable uh, object uh, material that would create a condition where architecture kisses back. In conclusion, we want to thank uh, curators Mark Lee, Sharon Johnston, and Sarah Hearn uh, for the invitation. This process uh, allowed us to work through uh, some of these ideas further. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Erin, and our project is called uh, Enjoy Your Deck, and we worked on this with some amazing UCLA students, Chase, Dong Zhao, Daniel, and Bronte, who graduated last year. Um, so we created a model of an online how-to home improvement video. I think for us, the online instructional video was an opportunity to rethink the limits of differentiations that people typically make between expert and amateur production uh, in architecture and buildings. So the videos are usually self-made, self-composed, and often self-narrated. They're usually composed of short clips and made at home with consumer-grade webcams. Um, I guess we've been interested in how they're a category of media that circulates certain kinds of images and how they often prescribe the official way of doing things while they also produce a set of language um, data and associations, like through comment sections at the bottom, view counts, pop-up advertisements, closed captions, and other options for sharing, which actually somehow get, actually get in the way of watching the video itself. Um, so because almost all amateur instructional videos are recorded in and around the home, whether they're inscribed with a pretty domestic focus um, or not, maybe the most particular of these settings is the backyard where both production and recreation happen, and aspiration, leisure, and performance are carried out through chores, projects, pastimes, and parties. Um, so of the nearly 300,000 home improvement videos on YouTube, a considerable number are of backyard decks, which require a little more than concrete, dimensional lumber, hardware, basic power tools, and generally a weekend. Um, so we made a model of a deck and made a video of the construction of it. The video documenting this construction project is about 22 minutes long. Um, and in the exhibition, it plays on an array of 15 monitors beneath the model for three month run of the exhibition. The backyard decks that show up within the running time of these online videos are surprisingly versatile architectural forms. Their complexity, size, and architectural form can be made to fit the site. Most of the time, they're not very ambitious. They often stick to a simple plan, tethered conservatively um, to the sliding glass door of the back of the house. In other instances, taking on multiple levels, enveloping an existing tree, or wrapping around the side of the house. Regardless of the details of construction, as viewers, our viewing of these videos is informed as much by the prompts that our narrators provide as by the choices of framing, editing, on-screen captions, asides, and digressions. So the model was constructed at quarter inch equals a foot, and right now we're working on a kind of cutout uh, paper doll book now where you can um, make your own deck. Um, so over the course of the weekend, um, you can fold up, glue, and assemble your own deck. I guess it's sort of more of a kid's book. Uh, we don't have a publisher right now, but if anybody knows of somebody that could make something like this, please let us know. That's it. Thanks. When Mark came to talk to me, I realized um, at this moment of confusion that uh, part of what he was interested in was thinking not only about making new history in Chicago, but making new history in relation to the history of biennials. And that what was at stake was thinking about the 1980 biennial in particular, which is to say kind of ground zero of architectural biennials which amongst other things was the biennial in which history reappeared, let's say, for the first time. Or that's the, that's the story around it. So I realized in some way that my job was to participate in this staging of history and the inclusion uh, of people like me who write, let's say, one way or another, rather than, than uh, design things was part of this historical exercise. So from the beginning, I found myself in a kind of hall of mirrors uh, about the role of history and how people make history. 
So um, it made me think about um, you know, what new history, what making new history might mean, and thinking about 1980, around 1980, and the many institutions, like the biennial being one, um, that were founded around 1980, where the effort was not to make new history, particularly in the sense of making new historical content, but rather thinking about new modes for producing history, whatever the content might be. So, for example, the founding of the German Architecture Museum that opened for the first time in 1984, but was sort of starting in the late 1970s, part of the director's thought about that was that his job as a historian was to record history while it was happening. So that was the mission of that institution. And it was sort of an interesting idea that the museum would be a kind of film of contemporary architecture unfolding, a kind of documentary film, if you will. Um, uh, and so I thought, okay, let's look at that. And of course, the you know, thinking, well, why wouldn't you just write a book about contemporary? And so then I was thinking, well, there's something about the museum, about reaching a kind of public that the book doesn't reach, and why? And then I was thinking about models and that people around that time really started thinking of models as the dumb man's way to understand architecture. So you've, I'm sure you've all heard it. The museum people in the room have said it. People don't understand drawings, so let's show them models. So models is a kind of dumbing down or broadening out of architecture just the way the museum is a rejection of the book in favor of the construction of new kinds of audiences. So this is sort of what I was thinking about. The fact that the German Architecture Museum in particular uh, was paid for, was founded with German money, um, which is to say it had a public obligation. This, this was all part of the stuff. So I go, I go off to Germany. So this is, kind of, this is gonna be my, net, my how do you make new history today while you're thinking about making new history. And I suppose that just means an Instagram account. So off I went. You see it was very unsuccessful. Um, it's very sad. I hope you all go like this. Cause it's like I got three people liking me like again and again and not much, uh, not much else. So, but anyway, I went off, I went off and uh, lured in part by this image, thinking, okay, I'm going to investigate this image of the German Architecture Museum and its models. And it took me until I was there to realize that there was something very bizarre about this image of what I thought was an exhibition, which is that it's not an exhibition at all. It's not located in an exhibition hall. It's in an auditorium. Um, and it was staged just for the sake of this photograph. It's a total photo shoot. Uh, set up um, and hired, the, the museum director hired an advertising agency in order to produce this image to promote this now collection that they had. So I was kind of fascinated by this, uh, uh, I don't know, fake news, I suppose. Um, oh, ah, okay. So my idea was I'm gonna rebuild this in Chicago. I'm gonna take this image, because they're working with images, and I'm gonna make this image in Chicago. And then I, the Germans started giving me a price tag. And I thought, whoa, architects really think of themselves as undervalued. Um, I guess these are really valuable because each model needed a little house of its own. And like the crates themselves were going to be 12 times the budget, much less anything else. And anyway, I'm walking through. I'm, now I'm starting my, my historical uh, issues around these models are being shifted by the commerce here. And I'm thinking, what's a cheaper model? What's a smaller model? What's a model that I can afford? And then I noticed under the table somewhere a model that I, I was very fishy to me. Um, and I thought I had never seen a Venturi model of the Guildhouse. Some of you know I've been working on the Guildhouse. And I thought, I don't think the Venturi's ever mo made a model of the Guildhouse. That led to some other research, and it turned out that the guy, Klotz, who was the director, just really liked the Guildhouse and wanted the Guildhouse in the collection, and he couldn't get a Guildhouse model because there was no such thing, so he just had some German model makers make one and kind of put it in there under the name Venturi. So I thought, okay, so the, actually we got a problem of the copy model and the replica model and the fake model, and then I thought China, so how do we think about making history today? You make fake things in China, 
Um, and by then I realized I was in a project of making things and I needed people to help me, so I called Aaron. Um, Aaron, I need you to, so we went off to Hong Kong and I was very happy to have found like an amazing, from the distance, an amazing paper model maker. This is one of the structures of the interiors of his models. Um, you know, really just, they make amazing things. And I thought, okay, I can't get the real models I'm gonna make, I get the guy in Hong Kong to make me um, amazing paper models. Um, you know, they're, 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 pretty, they're pretty impressive. I was really, or uh, my son uh, was really happy with this. He had wanted the Supreme Fanny Pack. Um, and I just couldn't find one for the life of me, but I found one in paper in uh, Chicago. This is Mr. Ha. Okay, so this is his effort to make Peter Eisenman's house too. And I thought, okay, there actually is something called Lost in Translation. And I think Mark and Sharon will never forgive me if I fill their galleries with um, things like this. So we thought better of it and we came back and Aaron got this amazing crew of UCLA students to start thinking about paper models. And then of course, you know, with the, the project, the problem started here, if, you're, if your evidence is a photograph, actually it turns out to be pretty difficult to make a copy of it in three dimensions, um, like really, really hard. And so how do you make a paper copy of something? It turns out to be a very significant design problem. There is no such thing as a Xerox machine. You have to design these models um, yeah, yeah, you're, you know, and they take a lot of work. They really take a lot of work. Um, so then the models, um, these are all paper replicas of the models getting ready to move to Chicago. They're very cheap to move. They don't need little houses or tea cozies or anything. They could just go. Um, so then we went, they arrive in Chicago. Um, and I had thought, well, we'll make a model of the German Architecture Museum. For some of you who know the interior of that building, it looks like a model. So I thought, okay, we'll just make a model of a building that looks like a model and we'll put in it models that are fake models of uh, models that don't really exist. Um, and we'll build out that photograph and it's gotta look exactly real. The one thing I wanted was when you walked in the thing that you had to imagine for a moment that you were standing in Frankfurt looking at the real thing. The problem with the real thing making it weird in a building, it wasn't big enough so we had to make two and you know it just it got kind of uh, complicated so if you're gonna make two you might as well make three, you might as well make them in other ones so you can take your little model uh, home and then you can have another model in a model just the way Unger's had a model in, in, a, in a model. So this is the money shot. I have to say when you come in it's kind of uncanny that um, Aaron did an amazing job with uh, making this foam thing look like a building that looks like a model. It, you know, it kind of kind of works. Um, and the models are really spectacular. The interesting thing about these paper models is that they're way more great than the actual models, um, which you can see on the back screen because having been priced out of the original models. I thought I need to find a partner who can afford them, and that's you know a private university with a lot of money. So over there on the East Coast, which is what you're seeing in the video, there are the actual models from Germany sitting there. So there's a live feed between. So you're kind of caught. This is there, looking back at Chicago, um, where you. I'm getting. I'm having a few more likes by now. This is a long, but it's really sad. I mean, you know what's really funny is that we. If you put a video in, everybody, you get like hundreds, just like still photography is kind of a problem. Anyway, so then the press started to come out. This for me was the absolute best part because this was all about false facts, this making live history full of the model as a form of evidence and an archive full of evidence. And I'm making these models as close to evidentiary as I possibly can, realizing that this attachment to detail and accuracy is gonna turn into some kind of a problem. And then I'm so excited, Surface Magazine, we make top 10, yay, 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 what the fuck? That is not Frank Gehry. Um, uh, so then every single press coverage we had had something really fundamentally wrong like calling a Raymond Abraham model a Frank Gehry model or all of our names got mangled and we turned into something else. 
So journalism uh, in our field is really as full of fake facts as the museums out of which uh, we build our history today. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Vonna. I'm uh, speaking here on behalf of uh, Productora, the firm I, I run with my partners in Mexico City. Um, our project is called Two Towers, uh, and we are part of the vertical city uh, that was explained uh, previously by the, by the curators. So the Two Towers consists of two towers, first one in the Chicago Cultural Center, uh, this image you saw before, so it's part of this project where architects were uh, asked to reimagine uh, competitions for the Chicago Tribune Tower, uh, uh, entries for the competition to the Chicago Tribune Tower. And uh, as, as Mark uh, said, since, since it was uh, a curatorial proposal taught by, uh, by architects, the presence of, of, uh, of uh, the, the, the what we were asked by the curator was very specific. It had to be 16 foot tall, three by three foot wide. And one way or another, it was something that as uh, architects we were very comfortable with. To kind of work with something uh, sort of given fact, sort of very specific commission. And also to kind of work with it within a group of, of people that, that we, we, we felt comfortable with. Uh, the last the year before, it was like, um, it, it, the, the, the the question was much more open, in a sense it was like, what's the state of the art of architecture, which is something uh, what was for us much more difficult to, to answer. The interesting part of this is that these models, at the same time they would be columns, so that means they would be one-on-one -on -one something, sort of object in space, at the same time they would represent a possible project for a skyscraper in Chicago. Uh, and so we became very interested in seeing how Architecture always like switches forth and back between these different scales, between these different things of, of uh, uh, representation of a building or an object uh, on itself. Uh, so we kind of look back to, to one of our uh, uh, architectural uh, proposals from previous years, and we looked at the competition for the Bauhaus Museum in Weimar. We did together with uh, Derek Delekamp. And we kind of wanted to retake that idea uh, of like having a building, a higher building, uh, composed out of two different uh, elements. In many uh, occasions, when we had to do, uh, when we do higher buildings for a competition, there was a sort of scale that kind of related to uh, to a city texture, and another scale that kind of uh, became the double. So it's sort of totemic uh, composition. And we we sent in this uh, this proposal of doing this tower consisting of of a stacking of two different towers. Uh, since it was interesting for us how in architecture you scale between sketches and models and drawings continuously and between different different forms of uh, different scales of models, we said why don't we kind of develop this tower as if it is a sketch, as if it is an enlarged sketch uh, instead of a, a small building. Uh, and we said if we draw it uh, just as a sketch in, in black and uh, in blue and, uh, and red, big pen, then it could become again a sort of uh, a sketch that became a model that became formed. So we made this mock-up uh, in the office. Um, then they also the curators of the Biennale also made their catalog in the same way with a blue part above and a, and a, and a red part below. So we were very honored. Uh, and we started to work with a team of a team of volunteers to kind of start drawing uh, that uh, that model here. See how they cleverly combine all kind of big pens in groups of three or four to kind of be able to, 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 to make that 16-foot uh, model. Now the second, um, the second model um, is uh, placed in the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, and it's, it's in a very, very beautiful space. It's called the Torn Miniature Rooms. It's a sort of uh, a hidden space in the basement of the Art Institute. Uh, a place we've been going uh, quite often with my partners in our visits to, to Chicago. And also these spaces they kind of really collapse when you put your face close to these to this small windows, you really see sort of realistic representation of an image, and from a certain distance they just become extremely pictorial, just like small images again. It's, they're all made by a lady called uh, uh, Narcissa uh, Thorne, uh, who, like in, her in the 1930s and 40s, kind of uh, 
produced more than 100 of these interiors with a group of, uh, of uh, specialists and artisans. Um, so this is the, the space we asked uh, the Art Institute of Chicago to intervene. We said, why don't we place in this room, which is called the California Hallway, another model, exactly the same model as the one we placed in the Chicago Cultural Center, but 100 times smaller. So, again, like playing with this idea of different scales and, uh, and objects. So we uh, talked to this uh, miniature artist uh, who, who who had some experience in doing these smaller models, and he's tried to develop to develop us with us this this uh, only four meter high model. Here you see how he kind of places it into the into the California hall hallway, uh, Mr. Yurkovich, and how it then becomes a sort of object on the coffee table in this in this uh, in this space. Um, so it is it is uh, basically a sort of thought on on jumping between different scales and between. Uh, image as well between image and uh, and volume and drawing and and, and building uh, as a continuous act of, uh, of of our job as as architects. Okay, thank you very much. Starting with history and then filling it with fact seems like a, of course, and probably Moshe was well aware of this, the reversal of, of what a historian is meant to do, which is to take facts, make them into evidence, and then produce an argument out of the evidence. So that reversal, it just strikes me as uh, if everybody is making a fact, um, and then, then you have actually, the history is yet to be written, right? And so far as the history of those facts was not presumed in advance of them. So I, I, I'm curious actually to you three, first, uh, if you now uh, were to write a brief history of the facts that made new history, what, what would be, let's say, what would you argue about? As, um, <laughs> Seeing the, I mean, seeing the, the here again the journey 
everyone went through the lot of thinking that's been come to work, and we're just a tremendous, first of all, tremendously grateful uh, how much work and how much thinking people put into uh, something maybe as uh, ephemeral as a biennial. You know, uh, we also didn't try to answer too many questions. Uh, there are a lot of biennials out there. So this one is up there for three months. You know, so we, we want to address something quite specific. Uh, but at the same time, be quite open in terms of how people could respond to it. So we didn't quite know exactly. We, but what we can say from um, the, the curatorial invites, we, we can have a certain amount of expectations. And, but we didn't exactly know how people would deal with the, or participants would deal with the subject of history. You know? I, I think uh, right now I'm looking back, I'm looking back at a lot of the, uh, the entries. And I would say, I would say generally, certainly, there are, there are participants that reacted against history, and certainly architects who are participants who are trying to recover history, you know, maybe in a postmodern way versus a, a, a rejection of history in an early modernist way. But I would say, oh no, there's a there's a tendency to um, to think of an alternative to deal with history in, in the present. You know, so so that I mean, as a, as an overall. Um, reflection. I think this is something that is uh, that is encouraging to us. You know, I don't know in terms of what we would do next, in terms of uh, what uh, what type of history we would write, the facts that that as we produce. You know, and, and certainly also we have also been asked like, what is the next step in this? You know, we have, we have opened up this uh, um, at least this dialogue. And what will happen after this? You know, we have been asked, well, what what happens when you refer to history? You know, what what comes next? What does it actually do? Yeah. And, and I also find that some events that were uh, uh, occurred during the, the opening, and um, one of them there was this almost was a transatlantic divide between um, Europeans and, and Americans. You know, some Europeans think maybe this biennial signifies the end of something for them, whereas I mean I'm speaking very very broadly and generally. Whereas some Americans think maybe it's the beginning. So I think this is kind of interesting because. Also, some of the uh, curators of the next Lisbon Triennale, the upcoming Oslo one, were also reacting to this. So I'm very curious to see what would be, maybe some of uh, the next steps would be answered through, through those. Because I think for us, we're trying to answer to the first one. Yeah, I was just going to add to that. I think that we, we, we did, I think Mark perhaps touched on it, that we did, we thought about this biennial as part of the continuum that you know responded to the first one and would you know in some way be engaged by future future curators and you know perhaps um, sort of building on a little bit what Ronnie said about the first one was a sort of overarching survey of a lot of different kinds of ideas that people are looking at around the world. We felt that there was a moment to sort of look inward, not to say that architecture is not, is disconnected, but that there's a certain um, I mean it's it's not totally clear, it didn't answer, there weren't, there weren't specific questions we were looking for, but we felt that there was a certain kind of taking stock that was um, important to do at this moment and in a way reaction to the first one. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of questioning, I, I guess I'm kind of confused by the, the so you're saying what, what do you mean by that? Um, the things that everyone showed. <laughs> yeah, because I guess I'm sort of thinking about, I mean, there are lots of Let's say, I mean, even uh, I'm, I'm sort of struggling to with that question, I guess, um, or what we're discussing, like, which is um, the writing around the body. I mean, it's for me, yeah, I, I guess I've never considered writing history yet. Yeah, it just, yeah, just to the, I mean, it's it. To the to that point, because as a, as a historian, I know that the facts are not just a set of objects that have been cobbled together, and it's all the reason that those objects got found and got produced and got made, and their budgets and their paper and their big pens or whatever. So all of that should be included, presumably. And it's interesting, I guess. Um, this is a segue to the next question, which is that that insofar as the building is a or was a library that it should have already had within it the kind of effort at producing and restoring and managing the data of history. Um, uh, I guess my next question would be, uh, well, it's not to you guys, but to, to the rest of the panel. Uh, 
how, in a way, the, the issue of when, when you repeatedly, in your introduction, use the word interpretation or reinterpretation of, of, of historical object or historical artifact, um, I was surprised by how many times all participants used either the word reading or, in your case, Aaron, viewing. Um, which is to say, uh, the act of interpretation, which was what I heard the curators say, interestingly, was replaced, actually, with reading. And, and even you, in your case, reading somebody else's reading. You know? So, um, uh, to me, like the, the assumption on the part of the curators was that you were going to come in active, and if, I, if I'm not mistaken, reading to be an act, activity, but it, it tends to have a kind of passive, uh, uh, I assume that you're reading as in, you know, you know like, uh, receiving. So, this might be specifically to you, Jimenez, and to Aaron, uh, maybe especially when viewing it's, itself is something that we see as like even a more passive, at least this is what they tell me at the lab school, is an even more passive way of engaging <laughs> in material than reading it. Yeah. Wait, uh, so just in part because I'm looking at um, a bunch of students that were in class this morning who spent the morning talking about reading. See, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, got, yeah. Um, I, I guess. Maybe before dot, sort of diving diving too far in, um, uh, I would just would make an, a, broad, a broader, uh, like a different, slightly different kind of observation, um, which, which is weird as a participant. I, I suppose I'm not supposed to imagine that I could draw out and make an observation. Uh, but Bob Sommel told me in Chicago that I shouldn't stick to those rules and I could I could just break them and be a critic also. Um, the one thing that I felt was interesting about the biennial um, was the the way certain rooms were highly controlled curatorially, and other areas were not, and that the curatorial control was exerted in the degree to which the room was controllable. So the big, clear rooms were controlled, and the nasty corridor spaces, the most of them were like, pray God do something good, a little bit like that. And I thought, I thought that was a super interesting because it set up, it staged curatorial invention, uh, intervention, in a way that I think has been a little wishy-washy in the last many biennials. Or it's either been wishy-washy or dictatorial, I suppose. So this, I thought, was a kind was an interesting symptom about a kind of ambivalence that I think most architects feel about curators. And you know, we heard comments of budget and mm -hmm. you know all of those things. And we know that we know that architects always lose money on these things. I mean, it's a very it's a very complicated thing. And I thought that I I I enjoyed um, watching. Um, the power of the curator and the, and its erasure in certain ways. I really I, I liked that. Um, another thing that I thought was Sukas, so I suppose I'm like an, like an old person, and as an old person, I wasn't given the same instructions. I wasn't actually given any instructions. I was like, do, do whatever you want. So, um, but, so what that means is I didn't know that everybody else had instructions. <laughs> I didn't know. And so it was only when I got there that I read on something you probably wrote that they had, everybody was told to bring a historic image and do all of their things, which you saw in these historic images. That everything that was laid out was a photograph. So I thought, okay, ain't no historic image because everything has been modernized by the technology of these photographs and probably none of them were photographs, probably all of them were scans. <laughs> so, and they were all sat there and they were all on this furniture thing like you had to see the image. So in fact, the, the reading of the installation design was that history had been turned into a digital scan and the digital scan was the thing that you saw as you looked. You could never separate the two. And I thought, okay, that's actually also interesting because if you were to then ask, 
what are the methods that we all have in common between architects and historians and so on and so forth, is that we're dealing with historic artifacts 99% of the time are already digital scans by the time we get them. And so I just, in terms of, maybe that's what I, I'm trying to think why I reacted to your saying that the book is empty. Uh, I, I guess I thought that what's really important about the Rocher book is that it's a lot of paper. <coughs> It, it hasn't been scanned. I mean, it's a kind of, there's some weird resistance to the PDF problem, the scanning problem, the turning everything into a flicker screen problem. And so, if I were to write a review, which I can't do, you know, uh, I guess, I, I, would, I would say that there was a very interesting um, kind of geology that was constructed with the digital, literally, in most of it, the digital images above, and some kind of fake bedrock imagined to be the base of those di digital images below, and then below that, the library. And so I, I guess I'm saying, I'm not sure that we're the ones that we can ask about what it was, but rather it would be interesting to have more readings of it, if, if you will. Like a reading of a reading. A reading of a reading, <laughs> because we just all told you what our reading for it. But anyway, I don't know. Did you? I, I, did, did, I, did I read it wrong? <laughs> I, guess, um, I mean, why did you put all, so like on the plinth rooms, hey, I, I apologize. It was obnoxious. <laughs> Where the images are. Right, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to enliven the evening, right? So <laughs> why was that evening, why was the design set up so that the historic image played a kind of interference role. Would, would you say that that's a fair description? Well, I, would, I think first of all, I was say that everything that happens in the mind, you know, how it turned out is brilliant. <laughs> but, 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 okay. but no, I think it's important because I, I also want to be self-critical. Like, if I look back at the fire bill, what would we have done differently? Certainly, some rooms are stronger than the others. It's, it's a very difficult building. It's a very, you know, we see that some of the Chicago galleries are very high rooms. So not a lot of spaces, are, uh, a, lot of, a lot of pieces are strong rooms. When, when I look back, uh, certainly the rooms that are, like Thomas and, and Adam and Peter's rooms are strong. It has this total image. And then the other twos are less. The other ones are less. I, I, I think if I, if, if I have, if we have control over all the rooms, it would be a stronger show, but we only have 30 participants. Yeah. So th there's always this fact about the biennial, uh, there's one role that the biennial will reach into a larger public. You know? So suddenly we also want to reach to the choir. You know? But I, I think there's this, this junction about how we can, on one hand, we, the, the biennial has this uh, responsibility to be a platform, a showcase of um, what's happening out there. You know? so, so I think, I think balancing uh, the, the, um, the, how the, the, the the themes of how the pieces are consumed by the world. So when I think back at, at the horizontal city, we also thought, hey, did we have one layer of curatorial information too many? Like was was it was the means plan necessary? Maybe they didn't. You know, it was it was our way of addressing. And certainly well, I think it maybe could it could be a greater plans, maybe that's okay too. And and some participants are not happy that they are their fellows with uh, people they find despicable. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, that was what yeah. was so worried yeah. about it, though. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Nasty yeah. bedfellows yeah. and street lights. I mean, I'm not saying, I, I'm not yeah. even saying it's kind of, it's kind of great yeah. in, in that. Yeah. We, we, we did wonder if, if putting the picture there is too bad. Yeah. We, we thought of, uh, well, we didn't want to put any signs in the Hall of Towers, you know, so they would be Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, then, uh, and, then, yeah and then people were pissed, and then we put signs on the Hall of Towers, and people were pissed. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what did you guys think about having, was that, what did you, how did well, you I, well, I came to terms when, I, when we arrived and we first saw it. <laughs> there um, was. You know, there was, nobody told us about it, which I understand that there was probably some of the logistics and things that, that actually telling us that information could easily be forgotten. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, yeah, I did tell you, that, that room for the house, honestly, is the toughest room. It's the ugliest room. I'm oh, sorry. That, that room where the horizontal city is uh, uh, 
installed. It was the toughest room in the entire building. It's the ugliest room, it's the darkest room. You know, so uh, we saw what was installed last year and we didn't think it was strong. So we really wanted to create something quite controlled. You know? you know, so you have this datum of light, you go in, you're not looking at the at the ceiling, you're focusing inwards, you know. And and, and this is something we also didn't quite know what how it would turn out. But I think there's a desire of thinking of something very intimate like an interior space in relationship to something that is more massive and urban in scale. So like two scales and no nothing in between. So um, you know, so that's that's what it turned out. Actually, your your little body is actually made me realize that m many of those plots were bed shaped, yeah. right? Was that I mean? So in fact, like lay laying a, a building down, like a kind of I, I or whatever I don't know, Empire State Building in the Chrysler with the Goodyear blimp prophylactic, um, yeah, or the Sears Tower, right, being laid down horizontally. Um, uh, even your choice of the section. Uh, which is the long section as opposed to the short section. Uh, there's a lot of anthropomorphism. I, I was also, uh, this is just to say that there's a, a violation of like looking down into something as well, as opposed to say looking at something. Wanda, you didn't have that problem because you just got to sit up straight. Uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, I, th I think it's uh, interesting to see how we're discussing the biennial in really architectonical uh, spatial terms. And also the way you present it, by end, like room by room, and see how every room has a specific spatial solution, uh, is uh, no. I mean, it's one way or another. It's something very close to me because that's also the way I would be worried about every every room because I want it to work spatially and visually. Um, but still, in that sense, I, I, um, I don't know. I think it, it draws a very uh, limited picture of this by end. Uh, and um, I, I'm still a bit with the previous comments in the, in, the, in the sense of what does it now mean to give a, a topic to that biennium, uh, that, that topic of history? And, and one way or another, I think it is, I know it's a term that kind of surprisingly uh, creates a lot of discussion. Well, uh, for example, in my work, I think the history is, 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 is like. Um, it's always there, also because of the, 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 by coincidence, the sites we have to deal with, or the buildings we have to deal with, or like they're always so charged with history, uh, that it's not a sort of, uh, like, I, I was surprised at how for some people the term history could be provocative. For me it was like, I don't know, like structure, like something that's like basic, the daily, the daily uh, part of, uh, and in that sense, I think, I think it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it was very successful, I think. The kind of, uh, the kind of, a sort of generic term, but that really one way or another seemed to kind of pin down a sort of uh, moment in history where something is happening. And then the relation that Sylvia uh, also kind of emphasized about what happened there in the 1980s and what happened nowadays about a sort of confusion between what is architecture and what is the, the superficial, the two-dimensional image? Uh, I think it's also really interesting. The also, your silver presentation, so we have only Instagram, and I think like the, the way architecture is seen and, and moves around and through Instagram and through, through, through uh, social media, and, and the way before this biennial in the eighties came out, and also architecture was. Um, I mean, I think only like so in the 70s people started to have color television and, and stuff. You know, like all of a sudden, like like well-printed, colorful media was kind of a new new thing. Uh, I think I think that's the other moment of the biennial that I think is really really interesting. The way that everybody's talking about spatial politics, but in the end, the presence of a flat image, and then of course, and, and, and it has to do with also the exhibition we did. At, 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 Grand Foundation about a year ago, but then, for example, seeing these uh, proposals like the Charles Moore paper uh, you know, construction, I think it becomes very interesting. But I don't know whether it's, I mean, I think that we, in, we still assimilate the digital image to the idea of photographic flatness. 
that that's our, our idea of, of abstraction is still very Greenbergian in, in, that, in that way. And somehow, I guess, again, if I were to try to read it as a symptom, I think that there's something pretty interesting happening about images that circulate through digital media for which flatness is maybe no longer the paradigm. So I, I was thinking, you know, I have something I just want to say about Aaron's project, but, but, uh, but just as an aside, um, on Instagram, so as a member of the board of a museum someplace, you know, I, I've been working to try to collect Elon Bond's Instagram feed. Um, just because if you were uh, going to be ecumenical and say where does architect architecture circulate the most, it's probably through his feet. Like, yeah. And um, so then, you know, you're at many hundreds of hours of man labor later, it turns out to be technically almost impossible to, to um, to collect the Instagram feed. Not only is there the problem of the who actually owns the comments and so forth, mm -hmm. so you, you've given them away once you post it up on Instagram, but the proprietary technology and so forth. So the museum is now thinking about taking each page and printing it and collecting them because they don't know what else to do. So I've now had an idea, which is now going to produce the paper fakes, which is exactly where I started. I can see that that's happening, and the paper fake is going to be, that's where it's going to go, and that we don't have a way to think about this. And so what I was thinking about, about Aaron's work on the manual, on the, yeah, on the online manual, for me it's the same kind of thing. So if you were to ask, where is history being made? in the sense of where is evidence being collected about building practices today, it would probably be there. And the model is not flatness because it's too inter it's too weird. It's just too weird and we don't know how to put our fingers on it and we don't know how to collect I mean basically we don't know how to collect it. We don't know how to turn it into a fact. We don't know how to turn it into evidence because all of our models of evidence remain paper, photographic, flat, etc. And um, I somehow I think that the the the, the um, this weird layering, this kind of archaeology of of materials, like building model digital image, that would be like if you do a section of it, that's what you get. It, it is definitely then beginning to think like, what's the new layer? And the new layer doesn't have a form that it can sit on yet. Somehow, I thought that was floating around in the. To, to Juana's point about the controversy that history would have produced is probably, uh, it's interesting to hear uh, Sylvia use the word archaeology because that in a certain way has a kind of scientific timbre to it that nobody would object to, one layer upon another, one thing after the other. But I think that probably the people who are most disturbed by history are the people who feel like history is genealogy which is to say that you're connecting yourself to somebody else. Uh, and that, in fact, it's not scientific, it's, a, it's yeah. identity. Yeah. I, think a, I think that's an important point. I agree. Uh, when we started, I mean, we were reading this uh, pro case of Ren Kohas in 1991 and 1992. In an interview with, I think, Alejandro, he said, well, he was commenting on the 80s, the, the previous decade. And he said, well, we're waking up from a, from a semantic nightmare. So uh, I was thinking, well, uh, are we waking up from any nightmares today? Are we waking up from a perinatric nightmare? Are we waking up from a nightmare of the new? I don't know. You know, you can plug in anything. So, but I, I'm not sure if we're waking up from any nightmares anymore. In a way, the 19, 1980 biennial presence of the past, uh, I think the lead of the article was titled End of Prohibition. You know? Mm. But maybe they had to deal with the uh, orthodoxy of high modernism, but I'm not sure if our generation or the next generation had to had to react against genealogy as mm -hmm. our, the previous generation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in a way, history becomes a much uh, horizontal uh, field, a horizon that we can tap into. You, you know, it's not something that is has the uh, can elevate something maybe like the most modern seesaw. Right. You know, than before, you know, so. Wait, I mean, we're talking about Instagram and all this. And did you notice that there were three mil 
three million views of that deck video that you showed? I mean, where is history being made? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Like, that's, and that's so they're that's only on nine likes. <laughs> <laughs> and we have 20,000. <laughs> I have a feeling that sometimes when I'm, when I'm teaching now, like, there's a sort of way of dealing with, with history and with genealogy that people just kind of freely use all the information at hand, which is now much, much more accessible nowadays than when you still had to go to a library and look at a book. No, it's really... You just go there. It's just an archive of our affinities and you have like 300 <laughs> car plants in front of you. And you kind of can use and, and, and uh, collage freely out of history without taking the ideological charge of these projects within the world. And that's, I think, is a sort of very different relation that, uh, that uh, see a lot of uh, younger architects have with history. Sort of free, uh, it's sort of, uh, uh, yeah, it's sort of, a sort of, sort of, uh, sort of uh, collection of forms and shapes and possibilities and they're completely disconnected from any from any view. So also sometimes that, that means they're disconnected from from the architectural uh, what, what what the, the architecture stood for. Uh, and I think that's yeah, it's very different. Mm -hmm. I guess it's a level. I mean, Bob Bob did this sort of move forward and. Just going back to the question of why those images are in the horizontal city, I mean, I think at some level that was part of why we wanted to we wanted to see what people were looking at, what inspired you, and what was the discourse among those things. And you know, and well, we definitely want to see what people were looking at. And we're surprising, uh, we're not surprised that there are many mis references, but the yes. amount of those references, but also I mean, even as look at those, so it was very different from how. Kumeko or Kumabetsi looked at those. And it's, uh, the source and the outcome, there's a huge difference, you know? And, and I think for us, that's, that's interesting. And then maybe like what Bonnie said, it's, history becomes less a, a binding agent than a platform for us to see the differences. Um, yeah, just to respond to that and also <clears throat> to address Michael's initial question about reading, uh, I think, you know, for, for me, I, I'm I, I think one of the qualities of the listeners is that they listen closely, and, um, and reading is, I think, one of the ways of uh, is consuming. You know, consuming is not necessarily a passive act, but a pre-active act. Uh, just uh, to address what Mark was saying, is that I've known um, Unel for about the same amount of time as I've known Andrew, which is 12 years, I think. And, you know, of course he would read Lowe's very differently because I knew his personality and, and I, I know my personality and I, I would hear what I want to hear when I look at Lowe's work. And I think just to maybe turn this all the way back to the question of identity, um, you know, whether or not it comes from the same source material, uh, uh, an identity versus another would, would produce different kinds of uh, outcomes. And it's, it's how I think language is produced. We have to stop. I don't think everybody needs dinner, but I just, not to be a downer, but, but I do feel, um, before we feel too liberated um, <laughs> by the fact that now we can turn history into anything that we want and surf it and morph it and sample it and mash it and so forth. I mean, basically, that's what we're talking about, using history in that way. You know, I mean, uh, this this biennial will also be the Trump biennial. I mean, this is so we had Reaganomics with uh, the previous, you know, the 80s. Now we're Trump. Uh, who's the I don't even I don't know what the adjective there would be. And I, I, I'm sure that you know the alternative fact thing is not. I hope it's close to your minds. Um, and you might remember uh, around during the election that there was a discussion about uh, Hillary Clinton and, um, uh, and Trump where one was described as a liar and the other was described as a bullshit artist. And so Hillary was described as a liar and this was defined in the following terms, that she knew the difference between truth and falsehood, cared about the difference 
between truth and falsehood, and used a deliberate lie for strategic uh, ends. And that Trump, on the other hand, was a bullshit artist, um, did not know the difference between truth and falsehood, did not care about the difference between truth and falsehood, and maybe more terrifyingly, had no strategic purpose in um, making a false statement or a true statement, but was just saying whatever was expedient um, at the moment. So, I mean, I just, I don't know. I don't know, but it's but like it's, a little bit scary. It's even scarier is that you have a strategic liar and a bullshit artist, right? Like and that's what I, that of art, course. That art is, is getting tagged with the same term rather than strategy, which somehow gets. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I think no, that all the have artist is the model for bullshit, yeah. right? That and right. That's what's scary. It's not that it's getting tagged, but if you look for somebody who doesn't care about whether it's a pipe or not, the model for that is apparently the artist in popular culture. So that seems to be very, very scary. And and I mean, I I I just. I, I, somewhere there's a line in there. It's not a line of truth and falsehood or facts and not facts, but there is, an, there is some kind of line in there that we need to be careful, we need to be attentive to. I mean, I think what we were hoping for was that we, I, I think that we observe the younger generation certainly, but I also feel they see history as providing a substructure to give meaning to this, so that not everything is equal. You know, so I, I, see, I think we see it as something very positive, you know, rather than seeing it as everything. You know, I think, uh, um, Maybe we can ask a question or two from the or have the audience ask. within architecture and I think it's a uh, it's really impressive to see what you've all done as part of that it makes me feel really pleased that this is happening from Los Angeles and from UCLA and there's such variety in what's going on but I wonder if this question about how uh, how curatorially clear the spaces were and intentions were in certain parts of it and yet how uh, maybe you'd say lack of coherence in the different approaches to those spaces doesn't produce a school of thought 
or, or does it produce the kinds of things that we ought to have nightmares about because we share something? And so I wonder if, if you would say anything about whether you were hoping in curation or maybe even in participation that you would see threads that would bind you one to another so that we would have some form of resistance uh, or some form of coherence in the work that we're doing rather than that we're each working in our own individual and identified, identified manners. Um, we did make some attempt to sort of see if there was overlapping interests, which was how the things kind of came about. But um, they seemed to be more, less about a way of working or the things that were kind of produced and more, I guess, in the things that they were looking at. So again, I guess it's a great use of the YouTube reference. Um, but I'm not sure that we sort of thought that was necessarily a problem. Yes. I guess, I mean, I mean, I think it's a key question of every biennial in the end. No? How can you then, out of all this, uh, these proposals, make a reading? Um, and, and, yeah, I think it's, uh, but it's been astounding how little effort has been made to make a reading. I guess that's what I'm saying. Sylvia, so, yeah, you do have to write your pretty. <laughs> I, mean, you have, I see you ready. And it, exactly. No, but I mean, um, it's, you know, the, that's why I felt that I felt it was really important to, to say that the, um, you know, the reportage was thin and incorrect at every conceivable term. I mean, I just like, dumb, 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 dumb. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I think that when we, when we think about the 1980 uh, uh, Biennale, for example, it was pretty goddamn co incoherent, but there was a there was a very coordinated press situation, and you know it was produced after the fact. So part of the issue for me is I don't know how it's going to be produced, or is it going to be produced, or how does it get how does it get managed, and maybe that's really the impact of the social media thing, which is to say that everybody's self-reporting and reporting and reporting on each other, and there's the video manuals and so on and so forth. That there's a kind of flotsam and jetsam review that we actually don't know how to collect, and you know, like Elon's Instagram, like it's out there. We don't quite know how to collect it and, and, and read it, I mean literally read it, as a kind of discourse about the thing. So I, I think that there, there was a surprisingly strong uh, common denominator in every, I, I mean again, super reductive, but like everybody's source was an image. Like basically, pretty much everybody's source was an image, and there was no longer any pretending that the image was a site or a place or a people or a political situation. That was just totally out there. So if you were going to say what was revealed, that was revealed. Um, uh, what the response to that revelation is seems to be out there somehow, but I don't I don't know how to collect it, and there it doesn't seem like like uh, art form or something is going to be the place that turns that into an observation. So get your thumbs out, guys. <laughs> last, last question. say that uh, didn't this speak to also uh, this idea that actually the format itself keep coming really more redundant in a way uh, that we have so many biennales right now we have so many kind of so the format itself is kind of like it's it's out of hand I feel like you know before we had Venice Biennale it was one central sort of uh, institution to organize this exhibition and bring artists, but then now we have sponsors and constantly like different format of reiterations of Biennale that in a way it's, um, I don't want to say it's kind of not manageable, but it's at least what is produced 
is out of hand with the you know in relation with uh, social media. So I wanted to kind of how many other biennial things are you you participating on? Yeah, currently uh, <laughs> losing money on. <laughs> no, uh, you might have a point, but I mean I still think there's as architects I mean we, we engage in one of these proposals a year maybe or every two. I mean. Uh, it's interesting, we just published a book we are, we are uh, uh, Space for Architecture, and one of the comments that uh, Barry Berdel makes at the end of his, of his, uh, of his uh, essay, he said that maybe I see that there's like two types of architectures arising. There's a type of architecture arising for that really has only exhibiting purposes. This type of architecture that are, and some of these architects are people that are more, more present in biennials and exhibitions. And another type of architecture that is more uh, working within the field, and, and more and more these two uh, types of architecture seems to disengage. And that's something very interesting. That the the, the, the frequency uh, of, of the biennials, the possibility to show, uh, and I think some architects, uh, and I'm going to talk now about such use elements, for example, architects like Andrew Schaake in Spanish. And, and some people, or even Sam Jacob, is a prolific writer and, and an exhibitor, have really made a sort of architectural career also based on, on exhibition proposals. Thank you. Good. Thank you. 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 Thank you.